hello. It's good to be with you once again this Holy Week. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jessica and I'm one of the local preachers in the Richmond and Hounslow Methodist Circuit. This year and indeed this Lent and Holy Week we've been thinking about the story of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark in particular and our readings this Holy Week and looking forward to over the Easter weekend are all from that Gospel. And as we've been exploring those stories and those themes, we've been thinking more broadly about how that gospel was put together. We've been thinking about the intentions and the priorities of the gospel writer. We've been thinking especially about how they wanted to portray Jesus, what was important to them that they needed to communicate about Christ. And we've been thinking about the relevance of that in our own faith and our own lives today. All, of course, in the effort to grow closer to God's work in Christ and to grow in our faith through understanding the context and the themes of our scriptures more. We're now into the holiest weekend in the Christian year. Yesterday was Good Friday where we commemorate and participate again in Christ's crucifixion and tomorrow of course will be Easter Sunday and our great celebration of new life and light in Christ. So today we find ourselves on Holy Saturday. Today's reading is from Mark chapter 15 verses 42 to 47. So I'll start by reading it and I'm reading from the NRSV version. So Mark 15 42 to 47. When evening had come and since it was the day of preparation that is the day before the Sabbath Joseph of Arimathea a respected member of the council who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth, and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where the body was laid. Let's pray together. God of sacrifice and love, bless our time reading your word. Draw us closer to your heart and closer to your will. Send your spirit on us afresh, that as we read your word, reflect, meditate and contemplate, your spirit might challenge us and comfort us, and send us out into the world to speak your truth, to work for your justice, to love your ways and your grace above all else. Amen. As I said, today is Holy Saturday, which is an often overlooked day in Holy Week for those of us within a Protestant tradition. For our Catholic brothers and sisters, this is the day when Jesus is said to have descended into the depths, into the depths of hell, to save the souls of those who died before Good Friday. And that day in, in Catholic tradition has been known as the harrowing of hell. Now, that tradition has um, seized the, uh, the minds and the imaginations of many creatives over the centuries and artistic depictions of this day include Christ leading Adam and Eve, Noah and sometimes even Judas out of hell. Last year my very first Bible study in lockdown looked at that tradition with particular reference to 1 Peter 3. It is a wonderful passage to re-explore uh, re this year as well whether you understand it as literally true or a part of the myth and mystery. It subverts lots of our ideas and expectations about death, about judgment, salvation and redemption. It elevates mercy and grace and God's unconditional love. And we all need to constantly re-engage with those things in our Christian walk. It feels particularly good uh, a year later as we're still in, a, in lockdown as we're still uh, coping with the Covid crisis but looking forward to hopefully a brighter um, time ahead and looking forward to a new way of being, uh, reintegrating and rediscovering 
some of what we've lost over the last year to be looking at this day again. Today is a liminal place between crucifixion and resurrection. It's about waiting, about preparation, about grief and about facing and contemplating the future which might be uncertain. And these, just as they were prescient themes last year as we started on a journey that was full of uncertainty, trepidation and fear. And after a year of much grief, much sorrow, we're looking ahead and we're looking at an uncertain but a hopeful future. So a day of waiting seems particularly appropriate. Now our passage from Mark today is very different to that passage we looked at last year. And it explores maybe some of those ideas in the context of the first Easter. So let's look first at the narrative of the text and then we'll think um, some, uh, something about how the themes in the passage are alive and important for us today. Now much of this passage is an exercise in apologetics about setting out the evidence of, a, of the setting out evidence that the events of tomorrow, Easter Sunday, Christ's rising from the dead are true. When we consider the possible intentions of the author of Mark, it seems reasonable to consider that here we are looking at an author who is keen to craft a definite and concrete narrative to prove and promote the resurrection of Jesus. Now we know from our study of Mark over the last few months that Mark wants to paint a very clear picture of Jesus as the Messiah and his defeat of death is a key part of that picture. We might infer that the author is aware of the contemporary doubts and disbelief surrounding the resurrection narrative and he makes space to address these in his gospel. Now it's difficult for us because 2000 years later um, and 2000 years where Christianity has grown and spread across the globe and perhaps become the dominant narrative, there's very little evidence outside of the Gospels regarding these objections people had to the veracity of the Easter story. We don't know what their doubts and speculations were. We can only infer from the evidence the authors of the Gospels choose to present in, in um, what they choose to refute. So firstly, Mark calls witnesses to the fact that Jesus was definitely dead as a result of the crucifixion, implying, therefore, that there were those who thought the sightings of him post Good Friday could be explained by him being taken down from the cross alive and then revived. Not only that, but his witnesses are establishment figures, Pilate and a centurion, so non-Jewish sources with no vested interest in supporting the idea of the resurrection. They're situationally very reliable because there's arguably no more desirable witness than your enemy. Next, Mark confirms that the tomb was definitely sealed by clarifying that a stone was rolled across the entrance. Tombs were sealed in this way to stop grave robbers and animals, so the stone would have had to have been strong enough to withstand human interference. So Mark here is assuring the reader that there could have been no post-burial tampering with Christ's body to in any way fake the resurrection. So Christ is definitely dead when he's taken down from the cross and he is buried in such a way that his body can't be reached. And then he also confirms that Christ followers have seen the right tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Jesus saw where the body was laid. The resurrection can't be explained by the Marys going to a different unsealed tomb or one that was unused or emptied. Jesus's body can't be hidden away in obscurity in a tomb that no one has seen. Now, there is a slightly radical departure in that last section, which is that the witnesses Mark records as seeing the tomb are women, who, of course, in contemporary understanding, legally and culturally, were considered irrational and their witness unreliable. Some modern scholars see that decision through an ap um, apologetic lens as well, with the following argument. If the author was trying to piece together a false proof, they wouldn't have used substandard, i.e. female, witnesses. The narrative as it is isn't too perfect. Now we may or may not find that argument helpful or convincing and more broadly actually we may find the focus on apologetics life-giving or conversely hard to get excited about. I have to say for me in looking at the Easter weekend and all the different things that we engage with and get involved with it's something that I find quite difficult and something that in the past hasn't been a particularly vital uh, part of my faith and it's been good in preparing this study to engage again with this text and across all four gospels we will see that each writer does turn to an apologetics lens at some point over uh, the passion narrative 
as part of their, their work and their transmission of the gospel stories. Now, apologetics, as with the other uh, gospel writers, is clearly of importance to the author of Mark. But, as I've said, it can be hard sometimes for us to see the colour and mystery of faith in what is essentially kind of cold, hard legal argument. Mark is almost a lawyer defending the case for the resurrection. Do we think the argument set forth by Mark is convincing? Do we think it would have convinced his contemporaries? Does it convince us? Or are we looking for something else in our walk of faith? Whatever our answers to those questions, it is a helpful invitation to think about what is important for us in this regard. And I expect we may all have different but equally valid responses to that. What does our faith need proof of to be alive? And where do we look for that proof? How would we represent that proof to others? Now in this passage, Mark is also clarifying that Jesus' body wasn't subject to the usual fate of the crucified. They would have normally been denied a burial and the corpse became the property of the Roman government to be desecrated or disposed of. And actually it's quite interesting to think about that idea of a corpse as property because throughout Mark, and of course we see this in the other Gospels as well, we've returned again and again to this theme of where people are treated as less than human, they're treated as a commodity, as collateral damage or as property. And Jesus' mission and the good news has constantly been to overturn that narrative and to speak of the value and the dignity of uh, particularly marginalised people. And we're reminded here again that Rome as an occupying force denied people that humanity even in death. But Jesus' body is different. Mark uh, shows that Jesus was given a different burial. He does this by and tries to prove that this was the case, uh, that the body didn't just disappear, which may have also been an objection to the truth of the resurrection. And he appeals to the authority of Joseph of Arimathea. He was a well-respected member of the Jewish community, and the Gospel says he is also seeking God's kingdom as Christ is. His involvement lends credence to the claim that Christ was buried in a tomb rather than his body disappeared and some kind of trickery taking place to fake the events of Easter Sunday. This element of the story is also of key importance in affirming Jesus' Jewishness and it is so important for us to engage with that part of it too in light of Christianity's historical and lamentably ongoing collusion with anti-Semitism. Joseph of Arimathea associates Jesus with Jewish orthodoxy. Joseph is an influential and a respected influence in that community, and he provides a strong reference for Jesus' ministry and his reputation. And then the manner of Jesus' burial underlines Jesus' Jewishness afresh. The quick and proper burial before the Sabbath is in accordance with Jewish customs and expectations. In death, as in life, Jesus is fully and wholly wholly Jewish and that's a fact that the author of Mark seems just as keen to underline for his audience as he is to uh, make a case for the truth of the resurrection. So here we have a passage that seeks to make an argument for two key claims. Firstly in defence of the truth of the resurrection which we celebrate tomorrow and secondly in favour of Jesus's Jewishness rooting Christ firmly in the faith of his community. Now, even with such a short passage, there's so much more that could be said. For those of us in England, there's a whole tradition to explore around the character of Joseph of Arimathea, who, according to a particularly whimsical piece of our folklore, was the first guardian of the Holy Grail and became the first Christian bishop in Britain. All fantasy, of course, but fascinating to see how his story has captured our imagination. Now, he also appears as a character in several um, apothecal Christian texts, the Gospel of Nicodemus and the Acts of Pilate, for example. And it's interesting to note that those particular pieces um, of apothecal literature also major very heavily on Christ's descent into hell and the harrowing of hell on uh, Holy Saturday. So also particularly relevant to the themes of today. And he's also, Joseph that is, is also mentioned in a number of early historical works about the church which give us extra details that aren't in the gospel. Now in a way this is a difficult passage to look at today because we haven't yet got to our celebration of Easter 
and it's already trying to prove and argue for the resurrection that in our uh, in the way that we mark Easter and the way that we walk towards Easter with the disciples hasn't happened yet. It's already setting up the proof for that. So it's keeping us on our toes. Now it's also, I find, quite a technical piece of scripture because Mark is making this apologetic argument in a day uh, that's tradition and a day that's traditionally about waiting. Um, we may not make those connections with that kind of cold, hard legal argument that I spoke about earlier. But there are real opportunities for reflection in these verses, thinking about what feeds our faith. Does this more technical approach to the resurrection inspire us? And there's no right answer to that. It also challenges us in the middle of Christianity's major festival to affirm Jesus's Jewishness, both in life and in death. And that's a task we need to take very seriously in the modern world and we need to take very seriously at Easter, a period of time where, um, to our great shame, Christians have often persecuted Jews. Hopefully these reflections help us to prepare for Easter afresh and for that message and gift of new life, the defeat of death and the victory of love and justice over hate and greed. So lots to think about in that passage as we get ready for tomorrow and the greatest reflection of all on Easter Sunday. Let's pray together. Loving God, who defeated death and rose again to declare love and light for all those who love and seek him. Bless these words to our hearts that they might seed there and grow there that we might become more like the example of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we too might sacrifice ourselves and speak truth to power, bringing the good news to all people, proclaiming liberation and freedom to those in prison, clothing the naked, feeding the hungry, bringing water to the thirsty and comfort to the grieving and the dying, that we might affirm each human made in the image of God, that we may never write someone else as property, that we might never collude with the powers of empire. Send us out from this holiest of weekends to grow in that image and in your love. Bless us and equip us for your work, O Lord. Amen. Thanks so much for watching. Just a reminder that there are um, a series of other videos and reflections on the Gospel of Mark for Holy Week also on the YouTube channel. And tomorrow morning there will be worship online and in person at Putney Methodist Church if you would like to join us. Details are on our website. Um, but whichever way we see you, whether virtually or in person, uh, I wish you on behalf of all at the circuit a very happy and a blessed Easter and a holy time to come. See you soon and God bless.